So the topic, uh, though it's a, a little bit dated now, is called nuking Nashville. And now I don't know. I don't, I don't know how many of you get the Tennessean. I don't know if there's any way even for me to tell how many get the Tennessean. They could raise their hand. Yeah, and just give me a sense if, if anyone reads the Tennessean. <laughs> Clearly not. Okay, a couple of people. <laughs> Rick doesn't like the Tennessean for some reason. I don't know what that is, but we won't go into it. But back in June, so like I said, this is history now. Back in June, the Tennessean ran a full page ad that claimed on July 18th, Muslim jihadists, they didn't use the term, but, but Muslim terrorists were going to set off a nuclear device in Nashville to destroy the city and the surroundings. And they claimed that this, this attack was known for a very, very long time. In fact, it was prophesied by a woman named Ellen G. White. Now, uh, Ms. White lived from 18... Yeah? yeah? I'm hearing myself now. Someone's got me on reverb. But uh, so Ellen G. White lived from 1827 to 1915. She was a prophetess in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And her prophecies, according to this one page, this full page ad, her prophecies were suppressed by the church. The, the writers of the ad call it the backsliding Seventh-day Adventist church, not the black, not the backsliding. That's their English wasn't that good. It was the backsliding Seventh-day Adventist church. Who the ad writers were doesn't say. My guess is they were non-backsliding Seventh-day Adventists who were trying to get this prophecy out in time so that, um, I guess, Nashvillians could run away to maybe Murfreesboro or maybe Tullahoma, where you know, they might be safe from nuclear blast and the, the uh, fallout that ensues. But they were, in the ad, they were quite enthusiastic about this. Now, I don't know if they were anti-country music or, you know, I don't know what their, their problem with Nashville was. But th the ad is written in a triumphalist tone. It's clearly Islamophobic. I mean, it's, it's filled with hatred of, of Muslims. But somehow the nuking of Nashville would prove the accuracy of Ellen White's prophecies. And that was very important to the authors of this ad. As Soon as the paper came out that morning, it was a Sunday morning paper. As soon as the paper came out, people started calling, emailing the Tennessean. They immediately withdrew the ad from subsequent printings of the paper, but it was out. It was, I mean, thousands of people had already gotten it, if not more than thousands. And there was nothing they could do about it. They printed an apology, but only for their um, ineptitude. I mean, they didn't read the ad. They just saw money signs, you know, dollar signs. And they said, oh, look, we can sell a full page ad. So they didn't really care what was in it. Once people started complaining, they cared. But, but I don't want to talk about the Tennessean. I'm just setting this up. What I want to talk about is why people love end times prophecies. Why, why is this a great thing that Nashville would be nuked? Why was this? I mean, it was supposed to be the trigger, even though we've had many, it was supposed to be the trigger for Armageddon, that finally the Christian uh, West would wake up and take up, uh, you know, engage in a global war with uh, global Islam. And that in the end of that war, uh, Jesus would come back. And if you've read, you know, your Bible, when Jesus comes back, it's not pleasant. 
uh, Jesus who said, you know, you don't, uh, those who live by the sword, die by the sword, comes back in the Bible with a tongue that is itself this huge sword. And he rides through the, the, in Israel, he comes back in Israel, he rides through and he slaughters thousands and thousands and thousands of non-believers. Um, so many, in fact, that the blood that's shed rises up to the bridle of the horse he's on. So we're talking a lot of blood. Now, most of the people he's killing are Jews, because <laughs> that's, that's where he is. And only 144,000 Jews survive this massive onslaught of the Prince of Peace. And the 144,000 who survive are, uh, do survive because they uh, recognize Jesus as the Messiah and, and do so with some kind of um, integrity. It's not like, holy crap, I don't want him to kill me. So yeah, you're the Messiah, you're the Messiah. I don't think that's what it is. They actually recognize him. Interestingly, you need them, the, the church that invented this theory, said it had to be 144,000 Jews, just as uh, the Jews were instrumental in bringing Jesus into the world, since he was Jewish, and just as they were, in, the, in Christian mythology, instrumental in his crucifixion, they are now instrumental in his return. Without them identifying Jesus as the Christ, the, the return of Christ is just not possible. So, for many people, this is not, I mean, for me, this is just a story. This is just a myth. It just reflects the craziness, not only of religion, but of, of human religious imagination. But for millions of people, this is fact. This is going to happen. Now, many in, in, in uh, St. Paul's time, the thought was it was going to happen then, I mean, the idea was Jesus was going to come back before another generation would be born. And that's why Paul seems to be against marriage. He doesn't, there's no point in getting married and having children, which in, in Ju the Judaism of his time, which was his culture, that was why you got married. You got married to have kids. There's no point in having kids because Jesus was going to come back and who needs a bunch of babies running around heaven? They're annoying enough here on earth. So um, it obviously didn't happen. And so there, there's a continual waiting, you know, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. In, in this scenario, he's coming, well, he was coming on July 18th, but there are still people who think he's coming. I was once, I, I, I just wanna reinforce how real this is for so many people. Uh, I was in Israel, oh, maybe let's say 10 years ago. I don't remember exactly, maybe a little bit more with a group of evangelical pastors from Nashville, really wonderful people. And uh, the Jewish Federation of Nashville put together this trip for six rabbis and 10 pastors uh, to go tour the Holy Land and sort of just share our insights, what, what it means as a Christian to be standing in Jerusalem, what it means as a Jew to be standing in Jerusalem and to compare notes and then to come back to Nashville and give talks about what we discovered about each other and about our traditions. It was a great trip. I have no complaints about the trip. Well, I could always complain, but, but nothing, nothing major. The, one of the first places we went was in Tel Aviv where uh, the it's now a museum, but the room in which the leaders of the, uh, the state of Israel hadn't been born yet. So they're waiting, they're listening on the radio as the UN uh, deliberates whether the votes, whether to support uh, a Jewish state and a Palestinian state back in 48. And there's a video and, and, and all around the room are quotes from the Bible, from the prophets about the Jews returning to Israel. And, and you listen to the vote and you listen to um, the voices of the people who were in that room originally celebrating the 
uh, establishment of the state. So the rabbis, I mean, we've been there before. Most, I think all of us had been there before. And we're listening politely, maybe even intently. It's a very moving historical moment. But that's all it is. We're listening to this recording from, of history. The pastors are weeping. I mean, not, not simply, they're, they're not, they're way beyond where the rabbis are. They're not just, you know, little teary-eyed. They're, they're, they're weeping. They're audibly weeping. And this is early on in our trip. We, we weren't sure what the, the rabbis, we weren't sure what to make of this or should we say something or what's going on? So every evening after our touring around, we would gather in the hotel and we would share, compare notes and, and share stories and, you know, ask questions. So that evening, somebody asked the question, what was going through your, your head, your heart, your, your bodies? as you were listening to that recording that caused you to weep so powerfully. I mean, we were moved, the rabbis, we were moved, but we didn't understand it. And their response to the person was, don't you understand what this means? It means that God keeps God's promises. God promised to bring the Jewish people back to a re-established state of Israel, and God kept, for in their language, his, God kept his promise. If, they said, if God keeps his promise to the Jews, God certainly will keep his promise to the newly chosen, the Christian. And that means Jesus will definitely be coming back. The state of Israel, the re-establishment of the state of Israel, proved to them that the end times is real and Jesus is coming. Now they believe Jesus is coming speedily in our day, as the Bible might put it, uh, because of the, re the ingathering of the Jews in the state of Israel. The rest of the trip went fine. I mean, all the trip went fine. And then we got to another place that the rabbis and the pastors had very different experiences. This was... Um, in Hebrew, it's called Har Megiddo, Mount Megiddo. In Greek, it's Armageddon, and that's how it comes down into English. So we're uh, at this uh, archaeological site uh, called Megiddo or Armageddon, and this is the site in, in Christian uh, mythology. This is the site of the second coming. This is where the great battle occurs, where Jesus comes back with a tongue uh, sword as a tongue. All these people are slaughtered. The 144,000 Jews recognize him as God, and the end times happen. The just are um, resurrected, and you know, all the just go to heaven. The rest, uh, you know, go to hell. It, that's the end of the the game. Again, we're standing there, and they decide this is, and, and they were right. This is the perfect place to read that prophecy. So they start reading it, and again, they're weeping. And the rabbis had, it, in Tel Aviv, our reaction was, this is important history. At Armageddon, our reaction was, what the hell are they so excited about? It's us that are dying in this scenario. Why is it that they're so happy to see us all dead? I mean, maybe they were, because we were all sharing rooms, maybe they were, you know, looking forward to having a single room for the rest of the trip. But why were they so enthusiastic about our being slaughtered by their God? So we asked them, and they were shocked. They never even thought about real people. They never thought about the, the thousands and the millions, actually, of Jews that would die in their story. Uh, let alone millions of other people. And they never thought about the people they were on the bus with. They were just caught up in, I guess, the theology of it or um, the mystical aspect of it. I'm not really sure how they would put it, but they didn't see the reality of it. I mean, it was going to happen in history. That's what was proved when we were in Tel Aviv. It's going to happen 
history will be proven accurate. That story will be, will be made true and real people will die, but they just didn't think about real people dying. And when you ask them, and this is not just about Christianity, it's not just about evangelicals, you can do this with anybody who is a believer in that kind of thing. When we ask them why God would slaughter all of these people, their answer was, that's God's business. That's not for us to decide. I mean, my response is, I wouldn't slaughter people like that. How can I be more moral than God? But they said, you know, it's, it's not about human morality. It's just about what God wants. In the theology of the nuking of Nashville, in the theology of Jesus coming back in Armageddon, even in the early theology of Genesis, which I'm going to talk about in a second, where God plans to commit genocide uh, uh, at Sodom and Gomorrah, the basic ethical premise is might makes right. right. God has the power and God can do whatever God wants. And we don't question, we don't think about it, we don't challenge God, we just go along. And we don't really mind because we're on the winning side. I mean, that's true in the book of um, Exodus and in Deuteronomy, where uh, the Hebrew God tells the people that he's going to slaughter the seven nations that were occupying the Holy Land before the Jews showed up. And they're going to commit genocide. The people, the Jewish people will attack and they'll wipe out every man, woman, child, and cow of the Amalekites and the other, the Hittites and the Jebusites and the seven ites that are in the land. And, you know, we don't question that because we win in that scenario. But we do question when we're the victims. In the Genesis story of Sodom and Gomorrah, I mean, you know the story, but really quickly, God says sort of to himself, again, it's God is a man, a man. I wouldn't even say just male, God is a man with superpowers uh, in the Bible. But so, so God says to himself, maybe I ought to tell Abraham what, what I'm about to do. Now, there's no reason for that. I mean, it's a strange thing for the almighty, all-powerful uh, super being who created the heavens and the earth to think he should reveal his teaching or his, his plan to a human. But anyway, he says that. Maybe there's something there. Uh, and so he tells Abraham that he's going to kill everyone in Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Abraham says, you can't do that. And the quote that comes down to us, Abraham says to God, how can the judge of all the world not do justice? How can the judge of all the world be unjust? God doesn't know he's unjust because from God's point of view, might makes right. God is the most mighty being in the universe. Whatever he does is fine. So Abraham says, you can't do that. You can't kill the innocent with the guilty. And he says, if, what if there's 50 innocent people in the town? You have to spare the town. And then God says, yeah, okay, maybe, okay, fine. I'll, I'll go with that. And then, you know, Abraham says 40 and 30, and right, they go down to 10. It's one of the more interesting stories in the Bible. Now, for me, the Bible is a human document. People wrote it. Uh, people made up all these stories. They're trying to teach us something. But the message that comes from the Sodom and Gomorrah story is that human morality trumps, no pun intended, human morality trumps divine morality. So just like I wouldn't slaughter people who don't agree with me, and yet Jesus does, or is expected to, how is it that my morality is greater than his morality? And in, in Genesis, God acquiesces to human morality. In the book of Revelation, God, uh, God does not. God, Jesus goes ahead and slaughters all these people, regardless of how immoral you and I might think it is. In the end times prophecies of almost every religion, it ends badly for somebody. Now, in Hinduism, it ends badly for everybody. Right? They're, they're equal opportunity, bad times are coming, people. 
So that, they call it the Kali Yuga. That's where, that's the, a Yuga is an age, an epoch. Kali is the goddess Kali, the goddess of destruction, but not only, she's also a, a creative goddess. So the idea is um, in the Kali Yuga, everything has to be destroyed so that a, a new creation can happen. So there's, I won't go through them all, but there's four yugas. The Kali Yuga is the fourth. Uh, so it's like a, after the Kali Yuga, then there's a golden age, and then it starts to devolve a silver age, a bronze age, and then the Kali Yuga again, and then another golden age. So it never ends. But the Kali Yuga, the destructive epic happens to everybody. It's not about are you moral or are you ethical or are you, you know, awake or awake, uh, enlightened or anything. It's just, this is just the nature of nature. But in the uh, Muslim tradition and the Christian tradition, <clears throat> the end times are for the non-believers. Uh, the, the, the negativity of the end times uh, is for the non-believers and the believers reap a reward. In Judaism, uh, it's sort of the opposite of Hinduism. The end times, everybody wins. At the end times, everyone goes, oh yeah, the Jewish God is the real God. And it, it says in, um, oh, I guess went out of my head, uh, Zechariah, I think, that everyone comes to Jerusalem and worships together in peace. Uh, in Micah, if I'm not mistaken, it it elaborates a little bit and says everyone comes together in Jerusalem and worships in peace, but they each worship in their own way. So it's very ecumenical. Christians don't have to become Jews. Buddhists don't have to become Jews. Everyone can be what they are, but they all recognize a central deity and a central ethical standard. And they come together in a sense of world peace. That's the Jewish end times because Judaism doesn't have a eternal heaven and eternal hell kind of thing. So it has to be played out on earth. So the question I want to pose, and maybe we'll get to this during talk back, is why do people want things, not things, why do people want the world, life, universe to end? What is in our psyche that generates this kind of, oh, I don't know what you want to call it, desire, let's say, for the end times. Now, if you think, okay, it's, an, it's bad times, the end times are bad times for you, but good times for me, well, then that's, I can, I can see that, right? You can say, oh, yeah, we win, you lose, ha-ha, you know, because in, in, in this life, you can't tell, in, in our time period you can't tell who's right or wrong really you know according to religion so at the end times we'll finally find out that i'm right and you're wrong no one ever imagines an end times where they lose right no no uh christian group imagines an end times where christians all go to hell and muslims go to heaven i mean that's just not the game uh or vice versa right the end the end times in an islamic frame uh, Islam is proven to be true and the other religions are proven to be false. So you can understand why that's the case. That's just, um, you know, what's, what's called zero sum gaming. In other words, you, you're, you live a life, you live your life in a way that there's got to be a winner and there has to be a loser. And it's just the opposite of a win-win has to be win-lose and everyone wants to win. So you imagine an end state where you win. That I understand. But an, an end times that wipes out the planet. I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm giving people too much credit, but so maybe it's all just win lose kind of scenarios. But it seems to me that it seems more spiritual it seems more wise it seems more righteous if instead of taking the win-lose scenario and make you know and, and establishing it as a cosmic fact that you say no you know what it's got to be win-win if we all don't win then we do all lose but in this article in the paper and this is nothing against seventh day adventist but in the article that's in the Tennessean, it's clearly a zero-sum game. 
it's clearly we win. Now, the we that wins are the subset of Seventh-day Adventists alone. Everybody else is going to die. Even, and given the passion with which the full-page ad was written, even, and maybe even especially, those backsliding Seventh-day Adventists. Why is it, and I've sort of lost track of time, so you're going to have to tell me, Carrie. Well, I've got, oh, you still got it? We can go right to 11? Yeah. So why is it that people come up with this stuff? What is it about us as, uh, as animals, you know, as psychological beings? What is it about us that, not only allows us to fantasize about mass destruction of those that are different than us, but actively encourages us to celebrate it and maybe even to participate in it, to bring on this end times. So I don't have an answer. So I have opinions, obviously, but I don't, I don't have an answer to that. But I like the answer that's given by Albert Einstein. So... Albert Einstein was, I think this happened in the early 50s. There was a rabbi whose son had died unexpectedly, and he wrote a letter to Einstein. And he said, how do I make peace with the death of my son and my belief in the supernatural God? And Einstein wrote back, and I'm not going to be able to quote it, But Einstein wrote back and he said that we humans are, or let's put it this way, we humans operate under a fundamental psychological delusion that shapes every aspect of our lives. He calls it ultimately an optical delusion, optical from the different eyes. He says, when you and I look at the world, we see the world as separate bits. So not only is there you know, me and, and you as individuals and me and nature, but there are subsets. So there's Jews and Christians and Muslims. There's, we constantly divide everything about uh, the world into these little groups. And then we, f- we scare ourselves by the othering of these groups. In other words, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're not like me, that makes me nervous. You have to be like me. And if you're not like me, now I'm, uh, now I'm threatened, you're threatening me. So he says, Einstein says that we have to overcome this optical delusion where we see everything as separate and realize that everything is simply a manifesting of a singular reality. Now, he doesn't use the word God. Einstein's not a supernaturalist. Einstein is maybe a pantheist or a panentheist, he believes that everything is a manifesting of of nature, which is singular. He he says somewhere, uh, Einstein does, that his God is is Spinoza's God. And Spinoza's God, when Spinoza speaks of God, he says, um, Deus sive natura, God or nature. For, For Spinoza, they're the same thing. So Einstein, Einstein says we have to overcome this delusion, see all beings as part of this singular happening or this singular reality. And when we do that, we would naturally take care of one another. But we don't. Why we don't, he doesn't say. How we overcome the delusion, he doesn't say. But it seems to me that that overcoming the delusion, that is the real work of authentic I was going to say religion. Maybe, maybe we should say spirituality. Inauthentic religion is all about power and control. Inauthentic religion is all about splitting people into groups, setting up a zero-sum game where some win, some lose, and making sure that my group wins, or at least affirming that my group wins. That's why the Jews are the chosen people. That's why um, 
early on Christianity said you were the chosen people, but then God rejected you because you rejected Jesus. So we have supplanted you, superseded you now. We're the chosen people. Uh, that's why the Hopi Indians call themselves the people. That's why the Japanese speak of Japan as the land of the rising sun. It's where everything starts every day. It's the most important land because that's where you know, the sun comes up. That's how the sun honors you know, Japan. That's why China is the middle kingdom because it's in the middle of, you know, it's the center of everything. Everybody's got their shtick about being the most important. So it's got to be built into the human psyche. And because it is, we can't seem to shake it. And because we can't seem to shake it, we do horrible things to one another. So the ultimate question is, how do you shake it? So I'm just going to give you a couple of suggestions and then we'll go to talk back. Mainstream religion, religions that are locked into, or let me put it this way, elements of mainstream religion, elements that are locked into this optical delusion of us against them, elements that are about the zero-sum nature of reality, winners and losers. Those kinds of religiosity, that kind of religiosity has to be abandoned. I don't think you can defeat it. I, I don't, I mean, maybe you do in a war, but that's, I'm not suggesting that. I think what has to happen, but, but I think there's an alternative to that. The alternative to that, and again, I'm not sure we have a name for it, but let's say non-zero religion or non-zero spirituality. Religion and spirituality that recognize the, the, the non-duality of all life, the interconnectedness of all life. I mean, the first, one of the first things the Buddha taught was pratityat samutpada, the everything arises together. Everything is interconnected. In Hinduism, they talk about Indra's net. We're all knots on this singular web of existence. You look at the Christian, Jewish, and Muslim mystics, they tell you the same thing. What's needed in our time is a resurgence, and this is obviously my opinion, what's needed in our time is a resurgence of authentic mystical experience. What we have is a resurgence of, of well, this is very judgmental, but what I think we have is a resurgence of faux mystical workshops and seminars and books you know you can you can go on zoom for an hour with some guru and, and you'll have some oh now you're a mystic and now you've overcome this stuff but that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about deep serious practice contemplative practice that ultimately erases or yeah puts an end to the optical delusion for your for yourself anyway you're no longer under that optical delusion. Uh, practice that liberates you from the zero-sum worldview of your religion, of politics, of economics. Uh, practice that lifts you into the win-win the scenario rather than it has to be a loser. And if we don't do that, I don't think humanity is going to make it. Now we're not getting blown up in middle Tennessee because July 18th has come and gone. I always wanna know what the people at the uh, non-backsliding Seventh-day Adventist ad writers said to one another on July 19th when they saw that Nashville was still there and they go, damn it. You know, did they come up with another date and prepare to raise money for another ad? Probably in a different newspaper this time. I don't know what they say to themselves. But we don't have a lot of time, I don't think. I think we are in, in an end times of our own making. Uh, I think climate change is, is an aspect of it. I think coronavirus is an aspect of it. I think you know, the, there's so many horrors on the planet, political, economic, um, climate, you know, all these different things that are part of this ultimately human driven collapse. It's not God, I don't believe in that kind of God, but it's us. We are 
the force destroying, um, you know, the human civilization anyway. I don't think we can destroy the planet. I mean, dinosaurs left, you know, but other beings came. So maybe we'll leave and something else will come. But, um, and certainly the cockroaches never go. They're always around. So if we aren't going to stumble into a human made end times, we've got to deliberately walk into a human made, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, resurrection, a human made a rebirth, a human made new times, free from the obstacle delusion and the, the zero sum gaming that defined us up to this point. Is that possible? I don't know. We're going to find out during talkback. <laughs>